Translation from love to sophistication. Or we want the language as well. Not so easy, but maybe not so difficult because the <laughs> common point could be uh, speech. Well, I apologize for my English, and uh, I apologize all the more that I cannot decide myself to write down the paper. So I will speak as I will be able to do. And um, the relationship between sophistic and politics is quite puzzling. Uh, first, because we have to take a lot of precautions to, uh, uh, to define sophistic. What is sophistic? Is it uh, uh, some men, li some pre-Socratics living in the fifth uh, century before Christ? Is it a specific movement? This is the title of a Kerfeld's book, Sophistic Movement. Or is it something like a structural effect uh, of philosophy? Something like uh, the first name of some bad others, you know, at the boundaries. Um, if I quote the, the, uh, the definition of our most orthodox dictionary of uh, European philosophy called La Longue, they, I, can, I can see that, um, I quote, sophistic is a philosophy of verbal reasoning lacking solidity and seriousness. Very bad others. <laughs> and uh, then the second precaution is what is left from sophistic? On, on what are we speaking of? Of what am I speaking? You know, there are very few bones and a lot of images or of ghosts drawn exclusively by their enemies. So it's quite a problem. Uh, uh, one sentence, one key sentence of Protagoras, I will quote later on, uh, put, uh, made huge and huge books of Aristotle, Plato, Sextus Empiricus, etc., etc. And there is one line. So um, I think that we have to um, understand that we, there are always, there will always be mediations. Plato and Aristotle are the two main mediations. For Plato, sophists are very, very bad. They are uh, uh, linked with pseudos, it means false and lying. They can, um, if, I, if I try to resume Plato's position, sophists are, uh, sophistic is philosophy of appearance and appearance of philosophy, all pseudos and doxa. And if I try to go to Aristotle, this, begin, this begins to be more, more interesting for politics. Because Aristotle's, Aristotle is using sophistic against Plato to find his own way in politics and uses Plato against sophists. And this would be uh, a long, would, would deserve long developments. But the point is that, in fact, you have the choice between something like a platonic tradition to uh, interpret politically sophists or uh, Aristotelian tradition. And from the part of Platonic tradition, you find hmm, uh, on the same part Heidegger and Badiou. And on the part of uh, Aristotelian tradition, you find someone like Hannah Arendt. So let me try to uh, draw the line between both. Um, if I if I go uh, with Heidegger and with Plato, well, politics is a question of truth. 
of goodness. And, um, well, you find a philosopher king, or you find ontology on the part of politics. And um, uh, the, what, what is at stake here is the one, the being. And politics is submitted to something else, ontology. Good, true. This is what um, Anna Arendt called professional deformation, deformation professionnelle. Speaking of philosophers, and of philosophers, political philosophers, from Plato to Heidegger, it's no more possible, she said. I don't want to be called a, a, a political philosopher, because from Plato to Heidegger, their propension to tyranny prevents me to uh, be called political philosopher. It's a professional deformation. They are ontologues. And from the part of Arendt, you find Aristotle, but sophistic Aristotle. Man is um, uh, poly is a zoon, logon, ekon, a speaking animal. Or Animal rationale, if you want. <coughs> it means the ratio and or ratio, discourse, discursive animal. And as Aristotle said in the first lines of politics, man is an so on political icon. He is more political than any beast because he has logos. More political than the bees, for example, because he speaks. So this is the point. This is the uh, Aristotelic, Aristotelico, Arentico, sophistic point. Mm. And if you are from this side, so uh, you are also on the side of plurality, diversity, relation, and taste, judgment. You are from the you are on the side of logos. And you remember that polis, polis, Athenian, Athens, is not Athens. It's hoi Athenaion, the Athenians. This is how it is said by itself. Mm? It's, it is said with a plural and with a diverse plural. And as Arendt, uh, quoting Burkhardt, often says, uh, polis, Athens, the most talkative of all words. So that's the point. Zoon politicum, uh, man, men live together in the manner of speech. This is an Arendtian quote. And second Arendtian co quote, uh, to look upon politics from the perspective of truth means to take one stand out the political realm. So that's the point. From this part, you are no more platonician, no longer platonician, you are no longer badul, if I can say. You are uh, really from the sophistic side. And this tension products, of course, uh, if I, if I quote some uh, modern judgments about sophistics, products uh, contradictory judgments. For example, Finlay thought that uh, sophists were the new wise men, mm -hmm. free thinkers, first Alf Plerer, but Grote, who is quite clever anyhow, thought that maybe they are so I know in French the, the, the word, they are a clergé établi, they are an establishment. Um, and it is not a question of generation. It has been said that the first sophists were real democrats, and the second sophists were, uh, the second generation of sophists were more um, uh, tyrannic. But this appears in one and the same man. So uh, I won't speak of him 
but it deserves the whole entry. Uh, it's antiphoto sophist. They, they, nobody knows, or we know, but, <laughs> but it is always supposed that they were two and not one. One who was a democrat and uh, who, who uh, was a real sophist, and the second who has a uh, lawyer and who has a propension to tyranny and uh, collaborate with the 13 tyrants. But when you look well at the, bi the biographies and at all the testimonies, you, of course, must be certain that, they, that it is one and the same. And I just say another word about Antiphon, because I think there must be an uh, entry. Uh, Antiphon proposed the word barbarizei. And I think that this barbaros or barbar or barbarisé with the verb, with the verb should deserve, uh, is a political concern. So I leave Antiphon, I leave Finlay and Grout, and I just want to say that all these uh, judgments are very well summarized in Hegel. Hegel said, uh, sophists were, I quote, the masters of Greece. And he explained master in the two meanings. They were their schoolmasters, and they learn, they, they, they make Greek learn. They are masters in paideia, in culture, and we will see the importance of that of that uh, tension, and they were and they were said Hegel, their master, their masters in politics, their masters, their ruling masters, because they gave constitution to cities and they explained how to be politics. And uh, Hegel adds, they were masters of Greeks of Greece because they were master of eloquence, master in logos. <coughs> so this is where I begin. What means to be in, politic, in politics, masters of logos? And uh, I will explore it with two, and only two sophists, Gorgias, and this will be logos of politics one, what is political performance? And I will explore it uh, with Protagoras, uh, Logos and Politics II, what is political virtue? And then, if I have time, I will try to conclude of what, what can be, uh, through sophistics, a consequent relativism in politics. So first, Logos and Politics 1, what is a political performance? Um, Gorgias. Well, my first, um, my first uh, remark will be about one word, epideixis. Epideixis, epideixis is the name of the, uh, of the sophistical discursivity through Plato and everywhere. Plato always says, well, there has been an epideixis. Hmm? Uh, Protagoras, did you make your epideixis, etc." So uh, I will quote it, I will translate it, try to translate it by the word performance. It is exactly that. Uh, epideixis is made on deixis. Deixis, you know, everybody knows. Hmm? I deck to me, I show. Uh, and um, let, let us remember that deck to me is the word, or the root word for decay, justice. So, dexis is this. Ato dexis, it's demonstration. You, you show things from the phenomenon. You demonstrate the phenomenon, apo, <coughs> and it is perfectly um, phenomenological. 
And then epidexis is the third word on dexis. Well, the second, if I'm contrasting with apo. Epi means more, something more. Um, you are showing more. You are showing more of the thing, and you are making is praise. It's praise, eloge, eloge. And you are showing yourself at the same time as a, uh, well, as the speaker. So you are showing more when you make an epidexis. And the epidexis uh, has been translated also by eloge. It is not only, it's a kind of uh, epideictic speech, you know, is, well, what you do when you marry someone and you, you hand a toast. This is an epideixis. Or uh, at the fun when someone dies, then you make, well, just what we all want to do for Ernesto. It's epideixis. So, performance. Performance and eloge. The first epideixis known is uh, one of the bones I was speaking of. It has been really well conserved. And it is Helen's encomium, Helen's praise by Gorgias. Uh, you have to know the circumstances. Gorgias came in um, embassy uh, to, uh, to prevent war from, from Athens with Sicilians. And uh, at the same time, he says, I will speak uh, tomorrow morning. At the end of the Agora. First morning, he made uh, Helen this praise. Helen's, how do you say? Uh, the contrary of praise. Plain. Plain, absolutely. Well, as usual, you know, he said he was, the, she, she is the most guilty of women. That's all. Everybody knows it. Homer knows it. Uh, well, she follows her her lover, and uh, well, she put the fire in the whole Greece, and etc. But uh, tomorrow morning, same place, same heart, I will, say Gorias, I will have another discourse, another speech. And this was Helen's praise, and it, is, it has been conserved. And in this discourse, in this speech, Gorgias uh, shows that Helen is absolutely not guilty. And she's not guilty because maybe gods wanted her to do what she had done. Maybe uh, she was raped by, by uh, strength. Or maybe she was just hearing what was said to her. And she fell in love with Paris here in Paris, she. And then she was not guilty. She was not guilty because Logos is a tyrant, and you cannot resist. And I want to show you the, the, the way, with this epidexis, Gorgias says, thematize, thematizes the changing of values. He proposes uh, uh, from he proposes really a new Helen. He builds a new person, and well, uh, the performance is politics is a political performance uh, because it makes a change in the people here and in the word uh, will it end from orthodoxy and then is guilty to creation of values this is what is produced by the uh, praise let me quote the two first sentences in a bad translation but it's a lot of translation um, the two 
uh, first sentences of the Eloge des Men. Order for a city is the excellence of its men, for a body beauty, for a soul wisdom, for an action value, for a speech truth. Their opposite is disorder. Man, woman, speech, deed, city, things should be honored with praise if praiseworthy and incur blame if blameworthy. For to blame the praiseable or to praise the blameable is of equal error and ignorance. Here you have the consensus, the perfect orthodoxy. All the words, all the big words of Greece are there and we are in perfect orthodoxy. Then second sentence. It is to the same man that it befalls to say with rectitude what must be said and to contradict those who blame Helen, a woman which brought together in one voice and one soul the poet's songs, the auditor's credence, and the noise of a name which bears the memory of misfortunes. I want, giving logic to this course, to have brought to an end the accusation against she of whom we hear so much abuse demonstrate that, her, that those who blame her are wrong, show the truth, and put an end to ignorance. And the demonstration follows. So, uh, this is a complete shift. Uh, it is political because it is able to change the values in which people everybody, let us say, believe. And it is performance, it is a performance, even in, this, in the meaning of performativity. It makes it occur. It makes a new Helen that will be uh, living uh, in Euripides, for example, or in Offenbach, if you want, or in Claudel. She is there now. There is a, another Helen called New Ellen in ancient Greece, the New Ellen. And uh, she is, for good reasons, innocent. And uh, you see that we are here really in, in something, well, such as speaks is all inside a pearl of, it, it's all inside a, a, a performative speech. I want to extend the idea of, of performativity. It's not only when you say, I marry you, and that you are the, the, the mayor or the curé, that it's, it, it occurs. But it's also when you make a real, uh, well, I don't know what means real, sorry. Uh -huh. When you make a political, effective speech. And this is what Lyotard calls la force du faible the strength of the feeble. This is very important, I think, to consider Logos as the strength, the force of the feeble. This is quite a political issue. And now I, I just want to, uh, to try to find a contemporary example, but I am speaking here uh, under the control of, of Jean, because I will try to, to uh, uh, make closer one sentence of Desmond Tutu uh, in, in the TRC commission and one sentence of Gorgias. So Gorgias said, uh, when in at the, the heart of Helen's praise, he said, uh, discourse is a great master, Logos is uh, Megas Tyrannos, which with the smallest and least perceptible of bodies performs the most divine of acts. This is the heart, the heart of the innocence of Helen. Logos is a, type, a kind of despot, master, and it performs acts. It performs reality. And now, uh, the, f the sentence of uh, Tutu from the report of the commission of the TRC commission, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It is a commonplace to treat language as mere words, not deeds. 
Therefore, language is taken to play a minimal role against violence. The Commission wishes to take a different view here. Language, discourse and rhetoric does things. It constructs social categories, it gives orders, it persuades us, it justifies, explains, gives reason, excuses, it constructs reality. So, uh, of course, uh, in South Africa, it has constructed the Rainbow People. Truth and Reconciliation Commission has been one way of try to construct something else, a new reality. And um, I just want to uh, underline some very close way of doing that, you know. Uh, I said that uh, uh, Gorgias changes the orthodoxy and uh, propose new values. Uh, on the on the wall where uh, of the house where Desmond Tutu was living uh, when he went to, when he was uh, going to Cape Town, um, there there has been a, a miraculous inscription, marvelous inscription, uh, graffiti, saying how to turn human wrongs into human rights. With, within, without any uh, interrogative, uh, how to turn human wrongs into human rights? Well, this is absolutely how to turn, you know, guilt into innocence. How, how to to uh, manage to make new values that we can share. <coughs> and uh, uh, well, um, there is a lot of things to say about that. But let let me just underline two things. First, there is a, a moment, it must be the right moment uh, to do that. It's not always that you can do that. And the, the Greek called that kairos. That's absolutely uh, uh, decisive in rhetorics, or in this type of rhetoric, I will call performativity or political rhetoric. For, not to persuade you, but to construct reality, to build a new reality, to, to build something new. This, you must take the right time. Ha! You hang the occasion by the hair. And uh, it's a target of opportunity, critical time. And then, of course, this has been uh, absolutely uh, thought by Tutu and by uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission when they wanted not to be in Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. Neither, it, it, it must be at a moment where there are neither vanquished nor victors. This point of bascule, critical time. Then you will, you will see, and this is for Jacques, <laughs> enough <laughs> of the truth for. Um, uh, that's what you said he wanted to establish enough of the truth for for uh, there to be a consensus about it or for there to be um, uh, rainbow people possible common past sharing etc the place of truth is just enough of truth but it is not the truth you don't you are no more platonico um, baduo um, no you are enough of the truth. The place of ethics has to be thought by this means. So um, if I call that perform performance, and if I remind that performance is uh, the same of the same root than performativity, it's because um, the end of Austin's book, How to Do Things with Words, Import me very much. He said, um, I will play old Harry. I'm very happy to play old Harry with the uh, two fetishes. I love playing old Harry with 
It's true false fetish and value fat fetish. So there we are in sophistical politics, sophistic politics, or in the link of the possible link between sophistic and politics. How long am I? Time is over. So okay, so you will never know anything about Pythagoras. <laughs> Many hands. Uh, so please keep your questions short and answer. Well. Could I say something directly? Yes. Oh. Um, yeah. I have a medical uh, appointment, unfortunately, so I have to go. I wanted to engage very much with what both of you said, but I just want to present a point of information to Barbara, and because I was so moved by your speech, I mean, I don't know that moved by yours, but this is all I'm going to say <laughs> for the moment, that I wanted you to think about a, a huge tradition where uh, arguing both sides within yes. a performance is part of the orthodoxy, the paksha pratipaksha in, in the rational critique. I only, I only, so that both sides, in fact, argue both sides so, in the performance, so carefully that you can't tell who is where in order to be able to come into, I only know it, I only know Nagenyaya Veda, which is a new uh, tradition which was uh, revised after the 12th century, but it starts actually before Christ, and it's the, it's the orthodoxy. So therefore, the idea, and I, if I may say something somewhat critical, I don't know what you think of this, but the Truth and Reconciliation Commission seems to belong to a kind of confessional Christian confessional tradition without absolution. We're talking about it tomorrow. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, uh, therefore, I have a feeling that in order to take the uh, sophistic, yeah. I'll be there actually. So, in order to take the sophistic as not necessarily something that undoes orthodoxy, one also has to see the millennial tradition where perhaps the orthodoxy incorporating well-developed tradition of what Europe would call sophistry. We don't, obviously. The, the, what happens when that is not necessarily a uh, performative road out into freedom? So I can't, I'm like jesting pilot, okay? Some of you know this line, what is truth, asked jesting pilot, and could not stay for an answer. I gotta see the doctor. But I hope that there will be some discussion of this and we will not remain within uh, European outlines after China and India have been taken care of. <laughs> okay, so I'm saying that with a laugh. Okay, I'm a Europeanist. I love you, but I just wanted to say that. Get that said. But you know that uh, sophists were the one who made the ago uh, real. So, uh, of course, th that's why they could be also said orthodox. But the point is, how do you, do you already, uh, today, how do you make something new in politics with words? But this is not the same than to say, uh, uh, who is, uh, let us uh, judge and have yes. a critical judgment and, 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 and let us say which, uh, uh, mm. there are two, always two positions. They have been that. They have done that all the time. Okay, but they've done something else, and that's the point. And I also, uh, and we will see that tomorrow. But of course, truth and reconciliation of commission is also a, a, a kind of uh, forgiving, etc., etc. Not only, and the point is this: not only, and the point is what else is happening. And how else? But I, I really very much like your talk. I will take it a little bit further, and I will say that uh, sophistics uh, might be the condition of possibility of any politics. Uh, of what? Of any politics. The condition of possibility for any politics. Uh, and uh, since um, uh, Laclau's spirit is uh, with us, uh, even his discourse theory, I think it's a, a, a post-structuralist rendition of sophistics. Uh, the discursive creation of political reality, even his populism, uh, the idea that the people is a creation of a discourse. So I, I, I would take it um, uh, much further, and uh, I wish I could, uh, we could have heard about uh, uh, Protagoras and virtue, but I, I'm certain that I know where you were going with that also. Uh, 
<laughs> so I have a couple of remarks for Barbara. Uh, the first concerns the division you uh, set at the, at, the, at the beginning between uh, the Plato line and Aristotle line. At the second moment, you said uh, uh, you clarified this is a sophisticated Aristotle. And I would like to insist on this because, of course, the division between Aristotle and Plato is not whether uh, about whether there is an ontology or a concern for the good presupposed uh, in their political project, because uh, you cannot really uh, separate Aristotle's political project from his, from his ontology, from his uh, uh, teleological naturalism, his uh, conception of uh, uh, human flourishing or uh, eudaimonia, all of the, and uh, his idea of uh, what a good life is, which is rooted in human thesis. So in other words, uh, Aristotle is as concerned for the good uh, or for what is good and for ontology in his political project as Plato is. The only difference is that they have different ontologies. Uh, and this, of course, gives birth to different political projects. Um, the, so I'm insisting on this because there is a tendency in the, in, uh, in the contemporary revival of Aristotelianism to uh, neglect the connection between, uh, uh, the intrinsic connection between uh, Aristotle's ontology and, uh, and his poly politics. The second, uh, uh, the second remark has to do with um, the performance part. And of course, here I need to disagree with Andreas, as usual. Um, and in the sense that, uh, um, so I would like you to clarify a bit uh, further, uh, like your notion of uh, uh, performance uh, in this sense. Um, you know, I mean, you're an expert of, so, uh, of, of the sophist much more than I am, but uh, I would say that uh, Gorgias' uh, um, uh, encomium of Helena is about logos, it is not about Helen. So uh, if there is a value that he, a new value that he creates with his performance is uh, precisely the idea of logos tyrannos, so the, the persuasive uh, force of, uh, of logos is not so much Helen, um, why? Because he pres precisely he, argues on both, he, he makes both arguments in a pretty convincing way. So my, uh, my doubt would be, um, first of all, um, is, the, is the value that you think is grounding this, like logos, as the, the persuasive power of logos? Um, is it possible to create new values uh, uh, through a pretty relativistic uh, approach to logos. So, what what, it, what really matters is that the persuasive power of logos, not the logos capacity of uh, indicating some truths. I'm not, I'm not saying the ultimate truth, but at least some uh, some truth. And uh, and I'm saying this because you connected the performance uh, uh, part of your uh, talk to the issue of the uh, power of the weak, uh, of uh, weak people. So logos has the power of of, of the weak people. But I would say. Uh, where uh, where was this power? First of all, I, 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 I probably I don't agree so much with the idea that uh, the real power of weak people is logos. Um, but uh, even if we assume that uh, this is the case, uh, where does this power lie? In its uh, persuasive in the persuasive capacity of logos, or in the capacity of the logos of weak people, of oppressed people, to uh, to use logos in order to indicate and to make uh, transparent a situation of objective injustice. So in other words, there is a connection between the content, uh, uh, some form of truth content, and what they say. It's not just about uh, logos as a, as a tyrannos. Well, a lot of a lot of good questions. But first, for Aristotle, um, I I I do not forget the uh, ontology of Aristotle. I say that uh, politics of Aristotle, uh, of course, uh, you, it's not a matter of only li live, mm -hmm. but good li life. Right. OK, uh, then, OK. We, are, we all agree with that, and we all agree with that ethics can come here, except that politics is the uh, archi architectonique. So it decides, and it has no Yes, it is like that in the Aristotle system. I'm sorry. Uh, well, it is said like that. It is theorized like that. So you can 
say, I don't agree. But you don't, you cannot say, it is not like that in this system, mm -hmm. uh, I think. So if you, if you say that, if you recognize that the politics is architectonic uh, uh, and science, episteme, so uh, it is very different from Plato. It doesn't mean anything by itself. It means, and it means something very important if you compare it with Plato, of course with Plato, uh, politics is absolutely submitted to ontology mm -hmm. and to ethics. Mm -hmm. And there is only one book, The Republic, that you can say that he is, it is at the same time politics and ethics. Well, in Aristotle, you have ethics and you have politics. And politics is architectonic. Okay? So uh, th there is uh, uh, clearly two models, I think. Then, um, uh, for the uh, other question, for, for la force du faible, uh, Lyotar says uh, logos is la force du faible. It means, of course, something very kind for logos, etc. But it, it doesn't mean that rhetoric is la force du faible. Hmm? It's not the persuasive logos that is the point. It is what are you, what can you make with logos, how to do things with words. This is the point, I think. And we have to clearly disting distinguish between rhetorics and performance. And of course, uh, all the Platonic strength, and even here, all the Aristotelian uh, uh, strength, trend, wants to uh, make us, uh, want to make us make one uh, with sophistic and rhetoric mm -hmm. and performance. Nobody speaks of it. Not, not, not any philosopher before Austin, and except Gorgias in this particular uh, 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 sentence I read to you. Okay, so this is what is very important to, to understand. I think you must understand that uh, philosophy and history of philosophy uh, has uh, complex has made one with sophistic and rhetorics, so that yeah. performance cannot happen. But rhetorics is persuasion, of course, and uh, persuasion must be submitted to uh, the, the values of truth and good. So that's all. And uh, it has been made very uh, explicitly by Plato uh, at the beginning of Gorgias, when he asked uh, Gorgias, but what are you doing, Gorgias? You are going rhetoric, uh, and re Gorgias says, "Yes, yes, I am doing rhetoric." It's Gorgias who says it, rhetoric techne, and it's the first apparition of the word rhetoric techne, and it's Gorgias who says it. Gorgias in Plato's Gorgias. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so everything is done. Back at 2.30? 2.30. 2.30. We are supposed to be in a 2.30. 2.30. Maybe they should tell us. Yes.